to all truths. His word brings salvation to our lives. His word is He Himself. So Father, we pray this afternoon in the name of Jesus, give us your word. Speak through your servant to your children who have come in here to worship. Those who will be joining us online, bless them, Lord. Those who will listen to the broadcast later on, as they listen to the word, we pray that you will convict those who need conviction, heal those who need healing, comfort those who are troubled. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name, and we all shall say, Amen. Good. At this afternoon, we've entitled our sermon, Godly Commitment Becomes a Realm for God's Blessings. Godly Commitment Becomes a Realm for God's Blessings. And this will be our focus for this very afternoon. Uh, we have been looking at the fact that when there is unity, uh, God comes and bless the people. In your marriage, in your family, in the church, at the workplace, once there's unity, God comes. We read from Psalm 1, 1, uh, at Psalm 1, 3, 3, that wherever brethren dwell in unity, there God comes to bestow his blessings. And what we'll be looking at, the second one today, that is that wherever there is godly commitment, that place becomes a realm of God's blessing. Godly commitment, God comes to bless. And the third one is when you cleanse your life from all ungodly things. And so God comes. But we shall look at that uh, topic next week. Amen. Today we are just focusing on how godly commitment becomes a realm for God's blessing. Commitment simply means the state or quality of being dedicated to a cause or an activity. And so when we qualify that with godly or godliness, it means that we being dedicated to that which will please God, to that which will help us live the life God has ordained for us. Amen. And our, our Bible text today, because our two readers uh, were not able to come, uh, tells us that when people give themselves to service in the church, the church becomes a place of God's blessings. Needs are met. The word of God is preached. And many people get saved. That's what our text will tell us. That when men and women, when the church members, those born again, those who call upon the name of Jesus Christ, when they give themselves to service in the house of God, the church now becomes a place where God comes to bless. And needs are met. Because then God will have vessels that he will use. And the word of God spreads, is preached. And many people are saved. And, and in absence of that, you realize that God does not have vessels to use. So that's what our text tells us. So we can all turn to the book of Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. So we've been looking at unity already. So there must be unity, and two, there must be commitment, and three, there must be cleansing. You get rid of anything that is not good in your life, in the church, in your family, and then the blessings of God comes. But we are focusing on the on the second one, commitment. The book of Acts 6, 1 to 7, it, would, it says that in those days, some people were complaining in the church because they were not being fed. And the leaders sat down, prayed, and they, they handed over that responsibility to some selected men and women. And so the results, verse 7 tells us that, that the word of God spread, then many believers come, uh, and they came to the Lord. Amen. So let's start from verse 1. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, so the church was growing, the Hellenistic Jews, among them, complained against the Hebrew Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. James 1, 27 tells us that the religion that God accepts as pure and faultless is look after orphans and those who are and widows and those who are in distress. And here, the church faced that problem because some of the widows, those from the Greek background, they were being over, they were not given food to eat. Verse 2 says, So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, 
It will not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, two serving men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, we will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the world of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Amen. So here we see a very uh, simple, uh, uh, how do you call it, a demonstration of, of, of God's grace that when, when there's a problem in the church or could be in your family, and if the, uh, you know, uh, we can get men and women who will be dedicated to handle the problem, we see that there will be more blessings uh, in the house. Hallelujah. All needs will be met. And as we've been saying, the church, we've come to, to the point where we must now do an, another, how do you call it, appointment of, uh, of, of leaders to handle all aspects of life. In fact, the vision I had, was it Thursday, Wednesday? It was like, you know, I mean, it was like a building that is heavily loaded on top. But the down is very, well, I mean, very, very narrow like this. And so uh, the building was collapsing like this. So when the, how do you call it, I, I mean, when the burden of the church becomes very heavy, now we have all kinds of things. So, so I mean, that was a vision, I think Thursday or, or Wednesday. And so in this church, we have very lot that God wants us to do. Hallelujah. But of course, COVID did not help. But we have just few hands who are taking uh, some responsibility. So uh, that is where we will be going in the next couple of months. Hallelujah. That, that, that we want needs in the church to be met. We want everyone to be blessed. And we don't want anyone to be left out. So we need men and women uh, who will give themselves to the service of the Lord. We have also established that as part of this series, that whenever there is a unity and order in your life, in your home, in your church, now, you know, that place becomes also a realm of God's blessings. We've talked about unity already. And then we're able to achieve these in two main ways, commitment, cleansing of the system, you know, of any ungodliness. And today we shall only focus on commitment. Our commitment can help us to do so well. So, I mean, the first thing we look at is that this dissatisfaction in the church. Some people are not happy in the church. Verse 1. The widows from the Greek background were complaining. And of course, if it had been today, we would term that condition a racism, is it? They were complaining that they were not giving food to eat. And those days, once you become a widow and you don't have good children, you know, it's likely that you become a poor poor person. And so they complain that they were not uh, being uh, given food. But let me mention here that suffering, hurt, dissatisfaction is a message that something is not okay. It is God's way of telling us to sit up and act. So God allowed those widows to complain. And that itself was a message. So complain, hurt, uh, suffering, pain. It is God's way of telling us that sit down. Something is not right. And that was what happened. And so we don't just complain. We pray to God for help to solve the problem. Amen. We don't just complain. But if you complain and you are not willing to solve the problem, the problem will still be there. And suffering is one of the ways that God uses to speak to us. So in the church, they were complaining, complaining. 
and uh, and God allowed that. I, was, I mean, so far in this church, we've not received any complaint yet. Amen. But uh, you know, I believe we shouldn't wait till we receive any complaint. Hallelujah. We shouldn't. We shouldn't. So what we do here, I'm sure most of you are aware, is that we try to identify some of the possible problems that we may have in the near future. And then we try to solve them now. So five years ago, when we had, we had a lot of young people, most of you were in your uh, early 20s, we said every young person should marry. So uh, there was a campaign, hallelujah. Almost every Sunday I was, I was shouting and preaching. And those who did not listen after service, I, I'll just call you and say, how is it going? Do you have any man or any woman? We're doing that, and after three years, we had almost 14, 15, 16 weddings. Just within 18 months. So most of you, at least 95% of the members are all married. Because we realized that we had a young, young church, and all those coming were in the early 20s, and the only way we can help is to encourage them, and it worked perfectly. After that, we also started drumming that every couple wants to have your mortgage. And then it's going well. See, I think most of you, uh, the rest are yet to catch up. And now, just last year, we realized that, so you've settled down, you have your house, you're having good time. The next phase is ministry. So now we are training. At least we have about eight couples being trained to go out there to plant branches and to preach the gospel. Now we've identified that our young people, those in their early teens and late teens and, and 20s, if we don't do something now to help them, we have a problem. So now we also focus on the young ones. You know, we, as we said, uh, we don't want them to stray before we start chasing and calling them to come. So we are also helping them to be on the right path. So, so, so this church, that's how we've been. Even, even for us to buy this building, for the same thing. Uh, years ago, we said, let's start fundraising because it's good that we have our own building, at least one in London. And then at the right time, God helped us. So, so that's how we've been working in the house. Hallelujah. And I think, I think it's something that we can all take home. Amen. So don't wait till there's a problem, but try to see if we can identify the problem. If you, you know, that can come on you and start doing something about the problem. So here, when we read, there was a problem in the church because some of the widows were being overlooked. And God allowed all that confusion to happen so that they were set up. And so suffering, hurt, dissatisfaction is a message that something is not okay. When you are in pain, it is a, it's a sign that something is not okay. When you are hurt, it's a sign that something is not okay. When you are not, you know, that, that satisfied, God is using that condition or situation to tell you to sit up and act. And so we don't just complain, but we pray to God for him to give us help. And so... The 12, the leaders, they gathered the church and said, it's not good that we allow this to continue. Now let's look for able men filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And let's hand over this responsibility over to them. And they did that. Now again, we see the priority of the word of God. But the leaders said, it's not for us. It's not good that we sit on tables. What that means is that it's not good for us as leaders to be, uh, you know, sharing food every morning, afternoon, and evening. So let's hand over that responsibility to other people, and then we can now devote our time, you know, for the word of God and prayer. So life, in life, some things must always come first. Hallelujah. Some things must always come first. God's kingdom must always come first. When the gospel is preached, people who hear about Christ can then be saved. Because faith comes by hearing God's word, Romans 10, 17. Faith in God comes as you hear the word of the Lord. So the leaders now, they devoted themselves to preaching. And, teaching. and of course, those of you who have been in the church for long, I think for the past the five years, I've, I've never traveled. Every Sunday you see me here. The five years or six years, I've never traveled. Here, every Sunday. Every Tuesday, every Friday, because the word of God must be preached. And once we have the bread of life, we must give the word of God. Hallelujah. Especially now that 
you know, this pandemic, you know, has taught us quite a lot. And, and, and the thing is, many people are not saved. Many people have not heard the gospel. In fact, I was reading a book last night, and, the, and then the writer was saying that all those who argue against the Christian faith and deny the existence of God, they've not even read a page of the New Testament. They've not read the Bible. So they don't even know what is in the Bible. One of them, a woman, became born again when he took the Bible and read the whole Bible. She's now a believer. But before she was an atheist, she said there was no God. He said, when I read the Bible, I found wisdom. And I realized that the word of God is true. So she gave her life to Christ. So it is the preaching of the word, hallelujah, that will get people saved. And then prayer, we pray to God for strength, for wisdom, for open doors. <clears throat> So in life, some things must always come first. You must prioritize and always put holy things first because when there is holiness and when the presence of the divine God, he comes in to bless. And that is what we need. Hallelujah. So Christ will tell us that seek God's kingdom first and all other things shall be added. Let's also look at verse 5. The children of the seven. So what we read, the text tells us that they chose seven men and they were all Greeks. Yes, they were all from that background. And here I've written down that there are, there are one, many ways to solve problems. There are many ways to solve problems. Some problems can only be solved by prayer. That's what Christ tells us. Solve problems, especially if it has to do with spiritual things and demons involved and Satan, it's just prayer. Christ tells us in the book of Mark chapter 5. There are other problems that can be solved by prayer and hard work. Some problems you pray for wisdom, for strength, for the know-how, then you must work hard. Then you get it done. Some problems, only prayers will, will not do it because we live in the physical realm. And if the problem is of spiritual or natural in nature, then we need prayer for strength and wisdom, and then we need to work hard. To get the results. And then there are some to that will require or that will demand you to change your lifestyle. Because most of the time, if the way we live is not godly, what happens is that we create more problems. So if you can change the way you live, then in fact you won't create problems for you to solve. So now I think the most commonness of all our problems. The most commonness comes from the way we live. The way we live, we don't, for some reason, we've narrowed what really gives meaning and purpose in life to perhaps having a bit more money and fun. So we've allowed these two to define our identity, but life has many other things to offer us. And so we don't really know how to live now. For example, we don't know how to nourish the human soul. We don't know how to make sure the spirit that is, that is influencing us is the Holy Spirit. We don't know that. It's because we've neg neglected that aspect of life. And we just focus on working hard and making money and spending, thinking that is all that life has to offer. But life has a lot to offer. So the way to live now is a, is a problem. And so we end up living anyhow. And in doing so, we create more problems. And then we have to solve them. Now, other problems can also be solved by putting things in order. If your life is in a mess and it's all over the place, you must take time and put things in order. But here, the church, what they did was that they prayed and they told seven men, hallelujah, that you solve these problems for us. We are not going to pray for this problem. You guys solve the problem. You have to solve it. So it been the whole church, meaning that the whole church, was happy that some people had volunteered to work on behalf of the whole church. Whole church was happy. And so I'll mention here that all, always encourage those who sacrifice your life for the service of God. Because when they do, they are, are serving you. They are serving those who sacrifice their life, their time. They are serving us. Through them, needs are being met. Hallelujah. Need to encourage them if you don't have time to do any of those. But 
But the good things I tell will come when you will do those things. And that's why when I'm not worried when people are not serving God. Your time will come. Hallelujah. You see, when your time comes, God will arrest you. That is, your heart will be turned. And then you just say. So your time will come. Hallelujah. One day your time will come. You know, I mean, a lot of you, I mean, those days, you know, you won't be that active serving God. I, I think I can, I, I mean, I mean, talk about Sydney. Those days. Those days, I, I won't get him. Amen. No, I won't get him. So he will just come and knock and greet me. Say, it means that he's going out. Then I'll be back. And then, in a young guy, he will do his waves, spotty waves. Shining, shine. I look at this guy. See? And then he will leave him. But when the time came, ah, when I'll be there, then he'll call. Is there anything that needs to be done? I say, ah, God has arrested you now. Amen. So, so your time will come that you will serve others. And so let's encourage those who sacrifice their life for the service of God. Let us not be jealous of them because they are serving us. Amen. So, so we said that we need at least about three people, one in charge of the young adult, young people, one in charge of the children, and then one deaconess to assist me, assist me in, in various things. And then when they are being prayed over, when the time comes, you know, just, just encourage them, hallelujah. Because what these people will do is that they are going to serve you and serve me and the church. That's what it means. So the church, they chose seven. They said, please. And when we read, the women, those who were not being fed, they kept quiet, hallelujah. Because they now had their daily distribution of food. Those chosen were all Greeks. If, 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 if Greek widows complained that they were being neglected, it means the Greeks were the best people to help solve the problem. And I hope you agree. Because in the church, uh, they have Hebrews and then the Greeks in the church, an open church. And then the Greeks were complaining because they were being neglected, the widows. So it means that you have identified the problem. So we need men from among you to solve the problem. When you are the first person to see a problem, it means that God is giving you the grace to solve the problem. When Jacob was able to interpret the dream that Pharaoh had and told Pharaoh that, follow your dream, this is the meaning, let me tell you. In seven years, there will be abundance of food, and in seven years, there will be farming. So do this, look for a wise man and make sure that he gathers food during the harvest time so that when the lean season comes, who have enough food to eat. And Pharaoh looked at him and looked at him and looked at him and said, Joseph, who, is, who else is wiser than you to do this job? When you discover the problem, it means that God is giving you the grace to solve the problem. It could be your own marriage, hallelujah. It could be your own marriage. You have identified this problem. You are burdened, you are burdened. And, and then your partner or husband or wife, you know, is not really into, into, into the problem. God is telling you that you must help solve the problem. When you just complain and complain and complain, the problem will be there for years. And at worst, you blame your wife or husband or your partner. But that's not the solution. Someone must solve the problem. Mm. You are the one. Solved. In every family, there are issues. Once you discover them, you are the one to solve it. And pray to God for wisdom and strength. Amen. And go ahead and solve the problem for the benefit. Those chosen were all Greeks. None of them was uh, a Jew. And so don't just complain, be part of the solution. Amen. Be part of the solution. If we are able to walk, you know, this way or live this way, but we will see problems as opportunities to better our lives and others. We will stop complaining. Because when you complain, it sucks you, is it? We'll stop complaining. And then we we'll solve problems. So so in this church. I mean, the thing that we've reached is to have 
are committed men and women filled with God's wisdom and Holy Spirit that we hand over responsibilities to them because we have a lot to do. They, they, I mean, they are there. Not, I mean, not as a problem. They are not. They are not problems, but they are things that we must do to uh, promote God's kingdom. Hallelujah! And you and I, our lives are in the church. I mean, I was saying this on Tuesday. We need one person, for example, to handle the singles ministry. One person who will pray and fast for all the singles in the church and outside the church, and who will be responsible. For organizing conferences for singles. Mm. Yeah. One person, I mean, two people. So every month, they organize conferences, seminars for singles to help them, encourage them, and to teach the word of God. We need one or two people to do that. Someone must do that. At least we need two people who handle, you know, marital issues and to help. We need at least two people who help with evangelism. So we sit and pray and fast and seek the face of God. Lord, where should we cast our net? And then these two people will come to the church and tell us, we believe this is what God is saying about evangelism. Let's go this way. And now it's good that we don't have a lot of you know, sicknesses that we need people to be visiting the hospital often. But if the time comes, we may need men and women. To do that. Now, if we don't have all this in place, we realize that when... When the time comes for you to, uh, you know, I, I, how do you call it? I ask for something and the church is not able to do. You complain like this woman. And you complain because there'll be no one to do that. So our, our focus today is very simple. That godly commitment becomes a realm for God's blessings. When men and women are committed in the church, that church becomes a place where God comes and blesses. Yes. Sometimes people will say, oh, oh, I went to this church. I didn't like it. I went to that church. Yeah, it's common. You see, the church is made up of us. And we have to do it so that it will become a nice. In fact, I keep telling every couple that, look, the marriage is, is, is for you. You and your husband, you and your, your wife. If you are not committed, if you don't put all your efforts, you will enjoy it. But if both of you are committed and you give your best, you begin to enjoy your marriage. And now, uh, 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 the book where we read Acts 6, the verse 6 tells us of the public laying on of hands. So they brought all the seven, and then the apostles, they laid their hands on them. And that was a symbolic transmission of function. So, so they were telling them that, as for this one, we won't do it. You have to do it. We hand over to you. They were also impacting unto them the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then they were also giving them the authority to go and do. And very soon the church will pray and lay hands on some church officials to serve in the church in, the, in various roles. I mean, we've done this, I think, on four occasions. We, we, we've uh, prayed for pastors and deacons and deaconesses, some have started branches, had others also fell. I mean, you know, others are also into all kinds of things. And so now we've come to another juncture, if you like, where the church needs to do that. So please uh, just encourage yourself and, and offer yourself to the service of God. Amen. But you see, I think to me, the best way to live is to serve God. That's the best way to live. Because you see, in this life, when we die, we leave everything, right? We leave everything. So, so the question is then, all our toil and labor, what we've gathered and acquired, where, where will you take them to? Leave everything. So the principle is very simple. Live well in this world and serve God. Make sure your name is written in heaven. But live well. Don't put pressure on yourself. Hallelujah. Live well. This world is not for you. Live well. Take time and eat well. Rest. And take good care of yourself. In, I mean, your house. Make sure you have one comfortable room. Hallelujah. Live well. And then make sure everything is working nicely. And then serve God. But see, when we die, one day we all appear before the Almighty God. And He will ask us, What did you do when I brought you into my world? 
and at least you can have something. And make sure you are saved. Your faith is in Christ Jesus because we all die. And after that, where will you go? Heaven or hell? Some people don't believe in heaven or hell, but see, when it comes to certain things, uh, I mean, it doesn't matter your belief. I mean, some things are there. Whether you believe it or not, they are there. So, so when people say, I don't believe in heaven, I don't believe in hell, I say, that is fine. That is what you want to believe. But there is heaven and there is hell. Jesus spoke about them. So make sure you are saved. Your name is written in heaven and live well, serve God. And when your time comes, you go and meet God. Hallelujah. And I think some of you have heard that uh, this uh, 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 T.B. Joshua, yeah, he's, he's dead. He, he died it, uh, early, early this morning at the age of 57. He's gone to be with the Lord. Only 57. He's gone. He don't know. And so all of us will go. So live well, take good care of yourself, and and they don't fight. Don't fight. Don't do it. Love people, help people, encourage people. You know, marry. You know, have more kids if you want to. And praise God, Hallelujah. If you want twenty, that's good for church growth. Amen. Yeah. You don't need to do evangelism just twenty. Hallelujah. Live well, and you'll be fine. And so uh, the last thing we shall look at is that the peace within the church and the growth of the church. Verse 7 says that, I'll just read the verse 7. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the Christian faith. Amen. Because the leaders were free to fast and to focus on the preaching and the teaching of the word. So many people heard the gospel. Many people came to Christ. The blessings of God was in the church. In the church. And, and as we said, many people need to come to Christ, hallelujah, and be saved and make it to heaven. And, and, and that, is, that is the duty of the church. That is our job, to give the gospel. The church has the gospel. We have the gospel. It is our treasure. It is a gift from Christ to us. And we must give this gift to the world. The gospel. And, and that is where we are going. Hallelujah. In fact, I pray that all of you here will become pastors one day. Amen. All of you will become pastors. Amen. To help preach the gospel. Amen. And then I'll conclude by mentioning the shaking of the church. And so let's jump to chapter 8, verse 1 to 5. The same book of Acts. Now the church had peace. No more complaints. Amen. Everyone was well fed. They were reading souls, but mainly in Jerusalem. They were having good fellowship. And God said, ah, let me shake this church. So God had to do the shaking. So chapter 8 talks about the Execution of the church and how they scattered. Verse 1. And Saul approved of their killing. So the chapter 7 talks about of how Stephen was persecuted and killed. And, and Paul, those days he was, he was called Saul, approved of their killing. So when people are not believers, they will always kill believers. If the people are not believers in Christ, they will always persecute the church. And, and Paul, those days, was killing Christians. So it says, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Hallelujah. Everyone got scattered. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. Three. But Saul began to destroy the church. He was now chasing and killing Christians. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Verse 4, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they were. Have you seen how God works, is it? They were in Jerusalem having good fellowship like all of us. We are in, here in London, is it? Having good fellowship. That anytime I mention evangelism, people say, oh, bishop. 
And so when that happened in the church, all of them, they were running away. And as they were going, they were sharing the gospel. So that is one of the ways God used to, to, to get the gospel preached. So the church initially neglected to take the gospel to the neighboring places as commanded by Jesus. And the church was only concerned with internal affairs instead of taking the gospel to Judea, Samaria, and the rest of the world. Acts 1.8. So it's just like in the church. Sometimes it's very, it's very comfortable to only think about our weddings and, and parties and fellowship. Hallelujah. The man will say, oh, let's do, let's do evangelism or let's talk about missions. Then it's like, ah. Oh. So the church, they were enjoying good time, like the way we are all enjoying good time. But when the persecution came, they all started running away. And they were preaching the gospel. And so God allowed the church to be persecuted. He allowed it. I mentioned in the introduction that anytime there is suffering, chaos, confusion, it's a message from God that hey, sit up and act. God allowed it. He allowed for to persecute the church so that the church will sit up and take the gospel. Abroad. In the same way, when God blesses us and we neglect to do missions, He will shake us. Oh, yes, He will shake us. Amen. And, and, and then I pray that He shakes us more. And the reason is that I, I think uh, it's throughout Scripture that when, when life starts treating us well, all of us, sometimes we forget about the Great Commission, isn't it? That's life. Every, in fact, right from the beginning, the Israelites, when they got to the promised land and life was good, they, they forgot about God. So, and I think, I think our Christians are very faithful when they are under pressure. Do you agree or not? No, it's true. We, we are faithful. We, so we pray very well if we are under pressure. But if life is good, we relax. So God, sometimes he allows us to go through things so that we will sit up. He does that. And so uh, because of this understanding, we are training men and women to go and to preach the gospel and to plant churches and do other things in the house of the Lord. So that we shall continue to enjoy God's blessings. Amen. So that your needs will be met. Because there will be men and women who will serve you. And God will be happy with us. So our sermon today is very simple. We have a bit of things to do today. So I will not go further than what we've said. That godly commitment becomes a realm for God's blessings. Be, be, be committed to your family, to your church. At your workplace, give your best, and that you see God moving so powerfully uh, to bless your union. And next week, we look at how Christ entered the church and cleansed all those who are selling and buying and, and then causing trouble in the church. And the moment he finished doing that, the Bible says that the sick and the lepers they came to the temple and he healed them. So when you take time to get rid of of, 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 of how do you call it, unclean things, ungodly things from your life, it, your life becomes a realm of God's blessings. Amen. Yeah, yeah, but if you allow all kinds of things to grow in your life, rubbish things, there are some people you need to yeah, tell them to discipline themselves if they are in your life. And then there are a lot of things that on next week I'll touch on. If you're able to do that, you realize that you have more peace, you know, less trouble, less distractions, then your life will move on smoothly. And in the church, we've been doing this periodically, hallelujah. We've been doing this periodically, and anytime God does that, we see some fresh move of God uh, in his house. We shall look at this, God willing, and then Sunday, and in this summer, we shall, I'm sure we will do it. We shall have one Sunday where we will treat midlife crisis in relationships and marriages. Live midlife crisis in relationships and marriages. Because sometimes after, you know, two or three years in your marriage or relationship, sometimes, you know, 
you express all kinds of things, amen. About the things that you are not able to tell anyone, is it? But I know there are some of you who have issues. Mm. You don't want to say them. It is part of the journey. So it is the duty of the church to help the members to make sure that they have some of these issues addressed. So I, I really promise that this summer, even more this month, next month, there will be one Sunday, we look at midlife crisis in relationships and marriages and how to. Now, if you don't solve them, it's possible that you can live with them till you die. There are some problems. If you don't solve them now, you will live with that problem till you die. So for me, I think the best thing to solve them. I've been telling you to live well, is it? One of the ways is to solve any problem that you think will take your peace away. Unless it is a thorn from the Lord, then you rely on God's grace. So I'm, I'm, I'm promising that we shall treat this topic. Let's be on our feet. Then we come to the